right. Um, so we'll go through quickly uh, some introductions, and then we'll get right into the heart of the uh, topic that we're here to talk about, which is uh, running the numbers. But um, And we'll dig into some of the weeds around running the numbers, but then we'll also make sure to talk about, at a, at a more broad level, the construction of the Bitcoin network, uh, the importance of people being able to access the Bitcoin network on a permissionless basis and on a sovereign basis. So um, myself, I'm Parker Lewis. I'm the head of business development at Unchained Capital. I help organize the things around the commons. Uh, Pierre Rochard, who um, is the auditor as well as the head of research at Riot. Um, Marty Bent from TFTC Rabbit Hole Recap, also a board member at Cathedra, um, managing, or uh, venture partner at TF, or, fuck, 1031 off my game, and then Matt Hill, who is, I believe, the founder and CEO of Start9 Labs. All right, we're going to start this out with Mountain Men, weird, and not weird, but uh, before we get into some of the, the deeper topics, let's just talk about running the numbers and the function of nodes and their importance. Maybe, Pierre, can you start off and... If, if you would like to give um, some background on SupplyGate, um, you were the one who made this known to the world, and um, a lot of Bitcoiners knew about it, but uh, shared with the rest of the world just the importance of running the numbers. Yeah, sure. Um, so it was uh, a story with many layers to it, but um, I'm going to start in reverse chronology of uh, where we're at today. So... Um, basically, running the numbers is a fun way of saying uh, performing a financial audit on a ledger. Um, my background, I got my bachelor and master in accounting uh, just down the road from here at UT Austin, the number one accounting program in the world. Um, but uh, I, I, there's still room for improvement there. I have some feedback for them. But in any case... Uh, I uh, studied financial accounting there, accounting theory, auditing, um, lots of really interesting topics to me. I know that to everyone else, they are horribly boring. Um, and I uh, started my career at Deloitte in Jersey City, auditing um, multi-billion dollar uh, mortgage-backed securities. Um, this was in 2013, so I had nothing to do with <laughs> what happened in 08, um, to be clear. So... Um, when I got interested in Bitcoin, I really got interested in it from the perspective of an accountant, uh, and I learned how to program Python and, and SQL and C++ after the fact. Um, where we're at today with uh, financially auditing Bitcoin's ledger, uh, it, 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 there's two major pieces to the accounting equation. One is how many Bitcoin have been issued? Uh, so how many Bitcoin have been added to the ledger through the subsidy in the Bitcoin mining process? Um, and then the other part of the equation is how many Bitcoin are currently circulating, right? The UTXO set. And so the idea of doing a financial reconciliation is that you want to look at um, the debits, which is, you know, all of the issuance onto the ledger, which you could... In, in stock terms, right, it's like how many shares have been issued, and then who, where are they now, today? What's the current balance? And so in stock terms, it's like who are the shareholders, right? Or not who are they, but uh, let's sum up how many shares all the shareholders have. And if there's a difference between those two numbers, uh, you need to identify specifically what is causing that difference. Otherwise, uh, somebody is either creating money out of thin air or destroying money. Um, and so in Bitcoin, when, when SupplyGate happened a few years ago, and we can talk about what, what that was, uh, the, the functionality of performing this reconciliation did not exist inside of the Bitcoin software. Um, it fortunately did exist as a pull request on Bitcoin Core, uh, which was uh, very useful then, uh, you know, when we wanted to poke at Ethereum, um, because that functionality continues to not exist on Ethereum. Um, and uh, the Ethereum developers understand that there is a difference between how much ETH has been issued 
and how much uh, ETH balances there are, uh, but they cannot specifically identify where that difference is coming from, whereas the Bitcoin Core developers um, and you as a user of the software uh, can actually uh, today specifically identify where the differences are coming from. Uh, there are uh, numerous sources for those differences, but in any case, they're all um, transparently identifiable in Bitcoin, uh, not the case in Ethereum, and not to pick on Ethereum, because it's also um, on, uh, I have not seen any cryptocurrency other than Bitcoin perform this reconciliation. I also haven't seen anyone other than myself perform it, um, which, uh, you know, it's, it's great that um, on Bitcoin you can run, you know, get, tr get transaction out, um, transaction set out info. Get out set. TX info? They, they need yeah, to improve the, uh, oh, thank you, get transaction outset info, um, which that gives you half of the equation. It gives you what is uh, the current uh, UTXO set, so kind of the balance sheet view, the current balance sheet view, but it doesn't give you the view of what has been uh, total issuance uh, up to that date that, you know, you would subtract those two numbers to, and then it also doesn't give you where the differences are coming from. And so this is where uh, Fabian Jar's uh, pull request really came in handy was that he actually created a statistical index on Bitcoin where not only do you have this reconciliation at the most recent block height, this index actually does the reconciliation historically at every block height, which is really useful because you could hypothetically have an inflation bug in one block height that then uh, gets removed in a later block height, and then you would never be able to see it by looking at just the most recent one. Uh, again, something that um, has not been done on any cryptocurrency other than Bitcoin. Bitcoin is, there's no alternative. Bitcoin's the only one that has had this reconciliation. Why uh, is a really interesting question. So um, the, the reason why I got from the Ethereum developers is that they don't care. They just don't care about this, which um, I, I, I empathize with that a lot because I understand that software engineers do not care about accounting and they don't care about auditing for the most part. Um, they, in fact, uh, they most, most don't understand it, right? So when I talk to them about, hey, why isn't there a financial audit of this digital ledger, ledger technology, right? Uh, they're like, well, you know, we had a a code audit of the software. I'm like, that's not a financial audit. They don't know what a financial audit is, right? It's just not something that they've experienced in their career. And here they are programming digital ledger technology, uh, which to me is just bonkers. But, um, you know, there's no rules, right? So it's all open source software. So if somebody wants to come along and say that they're creating accounting software, there's no law that says that they actually have to understand accounting in order to write accounting software, right? So. Anyway, uh, I'll, I'll yeah, and pause I, here, yeah. I don't want to just pick on other cryptocurrencies. One of um, my prouder moments was telling Pierre that uh, the Federal Reserve doesn't publish a cash flow statement. Um, and that when we were there on site and we went and looked up at the Fed site, it specifically said the Federal Reserve does not publish a cash flow statement because it has, I think, quote, special powers. Um, and that, so this, you know, the, the, the point being that auditing the supply of Bitcoin is incredibly important because it is what we're all relying upon to understand and verify that uh, arbitrary units of the currency are not being created. Um, Want to turn, but and that's not just not possible in other cryptocurrencies, but it's also not possible with the Federal Reserve, like the, the currency that we all use. If if we want to get our best estimates of how many dollars are in the world, we've got to rely on a web URL where the Federal Reserve says this is the average this week, but we don't really know. For gold as well, though. For gold as well. Yeah, we can't really audit that. Um, Marty, I want to turn to you. Um, we talked about this last week at the Houston Bitcoin meetup of just making this point of people sending you sats. As we were sitting there talking about Bitcoin and energy and the consequences there, just making the point that one of the, one of the most important aspects of Bitcoin isn't just to fix supply, but that you can receive payments permissionlessly. Talk a little bit about how you think about a node in terms of access to the network and in terms of preserving that right 
uh, with the ability to know for sure that no third party can prevent you from um, receiving funds or accessing those funds. Yeah, so, I mean, Pierre just wonderfully explained auditing the actual supply uh, in both sides of the ledger when you're actually uh, trying to calculate how much Bitcoin exists on the network. But as a user is receiving Bitcoin, the advantage of running a full node, again, one of the big themes throughout Bitcoin's history has been don't trust, verify. Uh, you can use a lot of wallet softwares uh, that are self-custodial, but if you don't connect it to your full node, you're depending on the, that software project to, to verify the incoming transactions for you. And that's the beauty of running a full node is that you can download the ledger. Uh, it will update once a block is produced, and then you can connect your node to your wallet software and verify for yourself using a computer that you own. And I have a node on this computer, and when I receive a transaction, it's connected to this node on my computers, verifying that it is a valid transaction and that I'm actually receiving it. There's no third party who's spoofing me, saying that I'm receiving a transaction when I'm actually not. And so this is the beauty of running the numbers, particularly around verifying incoming transactions, which is arguably more important than, than sending. But on the sending side, it's important as well to verify uh, with uh, a device that you're actually sending to the address that's being fed to you uh, via web browser or something like that. As well as sending, yeah. right? But particularly when you're receiving it, so you want to verify that, make yeah. sure you're getting the funds. Yeah, I mean, you absolutely do want to verify, but I'm saying that if you then want to you verify that you have Bitcoin, but then if also if you want to broadcast future Bitcoin transactions, you don't want to rely on a third party. Yes. Order of operations. You have to receive before you can send. Agree. you gotta, you got to receive before you can hold. Mm -hmm. um, Matt, could you talk a little about, about Start9? Um, I think a lot of people are familiar with the company, but specifically on the projects you're working on, because what you're working on is, be, you know, I think exists beyond the layer of, a, of just running a node, um, but also helps preserve kind of a full stack of creating independence and sovereignty, of which a node is a critical part in terms of accessing the Bitcoin network. Sure. For the sake of this conversation, I'll try to focus a little bit more on the, the Bitcoin node side of it, since I think after this, I'll be talking a little bit more about the broader picture. But, you know, um, if running a Bitcoin node is important, uh, which Marty just explained why it's important, uh, dovetailing off of uh, Pierre's explanation, um, then you want everyone to be able to do it. Right? You don't want this to be some sort of inaccessible esoteric activity. You want everyone in the world, if Bitcoin is for everyone, then you want everyone in the world to be able to do it right, not just to do it. Um, and so that's, that's where we come in. That, that was our you know, mission at the beginning, and it has since broadened, of course. But ultimately, our goal is to make it such that anyone, regardless of background or technical expertise or uh, budget, can run a Bitcoin node uh, with minimal effort and without compromise, without uh, in, in, you know, in bringing in the involvement of, of trusted third parties. So to do it right. Um, and so ultimately, you know, that's how Start9 started was, was really me trying to set up a lightning node, uh, which, you know, I'm fairly competent to do uh, I'm, I'm a developer and at something I could do and I, I set out to do it and pretty quickly within about an hour or two realized that it was going to take me kind of all weekend at least um, and then some to do it right and you know fully uh, over tour etc and I was just like if, if I'm kind of dreading this whole process other than as a fun experiment nobody else is going to do it. And so we set out to make it easy for everyone to do. Um, and in solving that problem, realized that we were actually solving a much broader problem, is how do normal, non-technical people um, take control over their digital infrastructure? Um, Bitcoin and Lightning just happened to be like a really immediate, obvious, starting point uh, because it's important and it's uh, hot. You know, it was in vogue. It's 
sort of in the public consciousness, at least within our niche initial market. Yeah, and I think that the, the point that you bring up about ease and, and usability, especially for less technical users, yeah. that you know, it might have been something that was achievable for people that um, kind of could work at the command line or you know, kind of are willing to, to fight for it, but that if we're going to have a robust ecosystem of mass adoption of businesses running nodes, individuals running nodes, that, that ease of use is critical to that. Um, Pierre, I want to come back to you and talk about, because uh, there's, the, there's the usability aspect of it, but there's also the cost. Um, and the importance of driving that cost or maintaining the, the cost um, at a low enough level such that it's actually achievable um, in terms of the infrastructure that might be required uh, existing beyond just usability. And I think it was, I'm not sure if it was Nick Zabo who coined the term um, unforgeable costliness, um, but then also the other side of that is that the ability to, to verify is functionally de minimis. Uh, but could you talk a little bit about how that relates to decentralization uh, from the, the cost to run a node um, and the importance of it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, just to, to recap the benefit, um, you know, the receiving a Bitcoin transaction, you want to make sure that the person who is sending it to you actually sent it to you, right? And that they didn't send it to a different address or that they're entirely fabricating the transaction. Um, and that one way you could verify that would be to go check a block explorer, right? A website, um, which is essentially just looking at somebody else's Bitcoin node and seeing if you find your transaction there. Um, it has a problem of one, privacy, right? That you are uh, revealing your interest in this transaction. But two, um, it could also uh, be man in the middle, right? Or spoofed. Um, so. Uh, there's, uh, uh, you don't necessarily want to be trusting uh, a block explorer for any material amount of money. Um, the second benefit is really like if somebody is telling you that they're sending you one Bitcoin, that would be completely meaningless if there's uh, trillions of Bitcoin, right? Um, they'd be like, oh, okay, you, you sent me another S coin. Uh, you want to make sure that you're actually receiving. Uh, a, one out of 21 million possible Bitcoin, right? That you're receiving a fixed percentage of the total diluted supply of Bitcoin um, so that you're actually receiving something that's scarce, right? And that um, has value. And so uh, that's really where uh, it's great to verify your own transaction with your node, but your node also needs to be verifying everyone else's transactions in order to have a global view of the total money supply so that you know what percentage of the money supply uh, you're actually receiving. Um, so in order to have that global view, that means that you have to download the entire ledger history. Today, that is north of 500 gigabytes on disk, if you include indexes and things like that. Um, and not only do you have to download it, but your, uh, the software that you're using is also going to have to verify it. Um, this the, the bandwidth cost is already too expensive if you are on dial-up. I'm not going to ask you guys to raise your hand if you're on dial-up, because that would be <laughs> utterly humiliating. Uh, or a badge of honor. Uh, just depends how you look at it. Um, but uh, you, you could never catch up to the latest block by uh, being on dial-up. So that's kind of at one extreme. At the other extreme, um, if you are, you know, on 10 gigabit per second fiber optic w with top of the line hardware, you can sync a node in like three hours, I think is kind of the, the current record of being able to process 500 gigabytes um, uh, of, of, of Bitcoin data. And that um, this verification is making sure that all of the data you're receiving is following all of the rules of the Bitcoin protocol. And there are many written and unwritten rules, not by unwritten, obviously they're written in code, but they are not uh, necessarily written in English. Uh, that you know, nobody's uh, actually written a formal English specification of the Bitcoin protocol. There's a lot of things that are just in code. Um, that uh, this really is about ensuring that you're receiving what your definition of Bitcoin is. And this, here we get into a really uh, philosophical point about 
what is Bitcoin? Um, because, because Bitcoin is open, you can define Bitcoin however you want to, right? So if the problem you'll run into, though, is if your definition of Bitcoin does not match up with the definition of some other person has that you're trying to send and receive money with. Um, so Bitcoin is what we could call an intersubjective uh, definition of um, Bitcoin's what we all agree Bitcoin is. And that's really what makes Bitcoin decentralized, is that you don't have one authority s saying, actually, th this is the formal definition of Bitcoin, and if you disagree, then uh, you know, you're on a fork. Um, it really is a intersubjective consensus that is grassroots, bottom-up, organic, uh, not dictated by a foundation, like, you know, the Ethereum Foundation, or, uh, and it, this is an important point, right? Like, I, I'm not making a um, kind of uh, an ideological point against the Ethereum Foundation. The reality is that the staking contract for Ethereum 2 is an official contract issued by the Ethereum Foundation, okay? It's not like it's some organic construct that uh, grew from the community of, hey, here's this contract we're gonna have. No, it's an officially designated contract that was deployed by the Ethereum Foundation. And that's how you stake Ethereum, is by using the Ethereum Foundation's contract. So it's not uh, decentralized like by any stretch of the imagination. But in any case, uh, not gonna knock you. You digress. Too. Yeah, I digress. <laughs> uh, you know, but it's the same thing with, with let's take another example of XRP and Ripple, right? There is a set of Ripple nodes that are the official nodes that decide what XRP is. That doesn't exist in Bitcoin. Uh, anybody can run a Bitcoin node. There's no official set of Bitcoin nodes that you have to connect to. Um, and with the mining, it's entirely permissionless. You can hash, you can contribute hash rate. Uh, the uh, other miners can't stop you from contributing hash rate. Um, so uh, again, I digress. The, um, the, the, the being able to verify this entire ledger history, not only does it require bandwidth of downloading 500 gigabytes, it also requires compute. Um, you should turn off assume valid, go into your preferences. I don't know if you guys turn off assume valid, but it's, it's an a, option. It's an option. It's a, it's a level of paranoia. Uh, uh, what, what is it? It's, it's basically that um, the Bitcoin core developers uh, have a checkpoint in hard-coded in the software that says that um, after this uh, block, or sorry, before this block hash, while we do download the block data uh, and we put it all together, we don't verify the signatures uh, that are spending uh, outputs. And uh, this signature verification, um, if you're trying to do full verification, right, of uh, crossing every T and dotting every I, uh, you should also be doing the signature verification. Um, but uh, if you um, trust that the developers put in the correct block hash, then it's okay, and uh, we haven't seen any issues around it, but anyway, I'm really getting into the weeds there. Um, but basically, signature verification and verification in general requires compute, so you, there's a CPU cost to it, um, and then you also most likely wanna maintain the UTXO set in memory, so there's a RAM cost there as well, um, and then you can either keep all of the historical block data in a hard drive, uh, or you can uh, prune and essentially discard blocks as they come in so that uh, you don't have to have a lot of hard drive space. But all of these are costs, right? And so they're very real costs. Um, one of the cool things about running a Bitcoin node is that you don't have to have it be online all the time. So one of the, kind of the, the properties of Bitcoin is that you can go offline for an indefinite period of time, come back online, and uh, sync up to the latest state of the ledger and not have to trust anyone for doing that. Uh, contrast that with staking where you actually have to trust the current set of stakers that they are not uh, feeding you false information. So uh, another huge difference there between proof of work and proof of stake. Um, and, uh, but I digress. Uh, the, um, all of this resource cost, it can be too much, right? So it's already too much if you, only have access to dial-up internet. Um, 
but there's not really a correct uh, amount of resource usage where we can say, okay, Bitcoin is decentralized enough because the cost of running a node is low enough, or Bitcoin is too centralized because the cost of running a Bitcoin node is too high. And so that's why we've gotten into this um, quasi-religious debate in the cryptocurrency community about what is the correct uh, set of trade-offs between the cost of running a node and the scalability or the transaction throughput of the uh, network as a whole. Um, and Bitcoin has taken a, a rather um, arguably conservative approach, uh, but I think it's also an accident of history because Satoshi Nakamoto put in place a one megabyte block size limit in 2010 before he left the project. And he didn't do any kind of studies or you know, analysis or anything. I think he just picked one megabyte out of thin air and said, okay, this, will, this is good. Um, and through the power of uh, momentum, which is really kind of um, not being able to do a hard fork or hard forks being inadvisable unless it's a survival situation, um, we, we, we have a, a relatively conservative uh, block weight limit now after uh, the SegWit upgrade. But all this to say, uh, uh, decentralization is a spectrum. Uh, but um, I think that it, today, I would argue it probably costs you $20 a month to $10 a month to run a Bitcoin node, um, just using uh, VPS as kind of the, the benchmark. But then if you're running it on um, you know, a Raspberry Pi, then you've got a, um, or a laptop, you've got to take into account, okay, what was the cost of my hardware and all of that and amortize it over the life of the node. Um, hopefully, uh, the, the, um, yeah, but I'll, I'll let, uh, you talk about the, like what the actual dollar cost, you know, would be. Sure. Yeah. So it, it varies a lot. At the end of the day though, it's like desktop software or, you know, server software or any kind of, yeah. Yeah. Pretty commodity stuff. Do you want to tee something else up or you just want me to? I mean, I, I do think that like continuing on this line of, um, kind of the cost to run a node that like an individual kind of making it kind of understood for the, for the crowd, um, the requirements from an investment perspective to run a node and that whether it's JP Morgan running a Bitcoin node or an individual that it, that it's a, not necessarily a fair playing field, but that it's achievable. Can you just help understand some of the inputs and the cost and the investment? Yeah, sure. So when you run a node in the cloud, and assuming that Bitcoin is not the only thing you want to run, right? Because there's LND, there's CLN, there's going to be these layer three applications that connect to LND and CLN. Uh, you're going to have BTC Pay, you're going to have Spectre and Sparrow and everything else that you want to run. Like ultimately, Bitcoin is not going to be the end game. Uh, if you want to get a VPS up to scale to manage that, it's definitely not going to be $10 a month. Um, you're going to be pushing $50 to $80 a month. So ultimately, you know, if you want a performant Bitcoin ecosystem server running in the cloud, you're going to be upward of, you know, $80 a month, uh, which after a year is going to be, help me out here, $960. Um, you can round up to 1000 with inflation. A thousand dollars, then then yeah, you're you're probably better off just doing it yourself out of your own home. Um, the challenge with that is that there's these sort of added, you know, efforts that are required to do it, which is what we have eliminated, right? So, uh, economically speaking, it's it's not just a sort of sovereignty, privacy, you know, trust no one uh, stance that we're taking, even though we are taking that stance, it's also just an economic stance, which is that ultimately you are going to be better off running a Raspberry Pi, and less so these days, by the way. Um, Raspberry Pis do have their inherent shortcomings, and there's some nuance to that uh, debate. I was on with Stevan Lavera a couple weeks ago talking through in detail those nuances, uh, so I won't get into it here. But um, there are many low-end, fully adequate computing devices that can satisfy your Bitcoin, Lightning, and extended needs that can be run from your home with minimal effort um, at a one-time fixed capital cost uh, for life. 
or I shouldn't say for life, but fairly future-proofed against the next 15 years, assuming you have enough terabytes to spare. Um, well, if you're pruning, you can... Which you can do uh, very easily on our platform. Yeah. Uh, if you want to prune, um, we have a unique setup that is actually unique amongst all the other node implementations and stuff like that, where you can run a pruned Bitcoin node all the way down to, what, 500 megabytes is the, the minimum or something like that, so almost no disk at all, that will allow you to run everything imaginable on top of it. You can run both LND and CLN and BTC Pay and all the third-party apps, and they aren't actually fighting over the pruning of the node because we implemented a um, service that sits in the middle of all of these other things and Bitcoin that can dynamically fetch blocks from the network. Um, it's called BTC RPC Proxy, which was written by uh, Kixunil, um, prominent developer in the community, that we adapted and augmented in order to satisfy our needs. So like on our platform, you're right, you can run a pruned node, everything under the sun on top of it, and be basically future-proof for forever, for the indefinite foreseeable future. Um, for what, $420 we're selling our device for. So as opposed to $80 a month, yeah, it's $420 once ever, and you're kind of good to go. For at least as long as the remaining life of the dollar, which probably isn't. <laughs> we but... intend to be on a Bitcoin standard by the end of 2023. It's an internal company goal, so we will no longer be accepting dollars for our products, and we will no longer be paying out to suppliers or uh, contractors in dollars as well. Now, we, we, we acknowledge that many people will still want to use dollars and we will put the uh, onerous on them to implement um, just-in-time conversion, uh, you know, products such as Strike or whatever to make the conversion, but we will only accept Bitcoin in and put Bitcoin out. Yeah, and that, that's actually interesting that you know, that's a thread that comes up a lot of times to me where people are like, well, when, when am I going to be able to buy something at the grocery store for Bitcoin? It's like, whenever the producer of that good figures out that they're no longer willing to take dollars yeah. or whatever local currency, and that's a perfect example of it. It's, on, it's actually the choice of the producer and then you know, a consumer, if they actually want that good, Correct. they've got to go find Bitcoin. Let's so, hope people want our good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. I want to uh, change topics or directions a little bit. Marty, you work in the mining space. Can you help the crowd understand kind of the difference between mining and Bitcoin nodes, the relationship between the two, but the difference and uh, the importance of those differences? Yeah. Um, so is it correct to say that every miner is a full node, but not every full node is a miner? Uh, no. No. No, because no, you, you don't. You don't have to run a full node. Don't have the to auditor uh, is going to throw the flag. Yikes. Well, okay, so we can get into the, the nuance here. The the nuance is that um, be, be, be succinct on this one. Give 30, us, 30 give, seconds. Give us a thirty second answer. <laughs> um, all all of the mining pools run, run a Bitcoin node, node, but a miner who's contributing hash rate to the mining pool wouldn't necessarily be doing that. And the other nuance is that you can do uh, SPV mining. Uh, and uh, the, the, this famously happened in, I think, 2015. Uh, somebody was SPV mining, and it caused them to fork off because they missed a soft fork or something. And uh, then seconds. after that, people were like, okay, you've got to run a full net to mine, otherwise right. you're joking. So not all miners are full nets. No. But no. in Stratum V2, at least one miner in your farm, if you're pointing it to the hash. But if a miner farm. wants to connect to the rest of the network or broadcast their blocks, they would... The pool. The pool. The pool. The pool. Node. The pool. Cool. Anyway. Yeah. So full node uh, on our computer, like we've been talking about, it verifies incoming, outgoing transactions, allows you to audit the ledger as well. Uh, a mining machine can be a full node if the miner is uh, equipped to actually turn it into one. But what miners do essentially is, is they're adding blocks of transactions to the ledger. Um, so they're essentially gathering 
transactions from many mempools across the world of people who are saying, hey, I want to send a transaction to this address. Uh, here's a fee attached to it. Will you please include it in the block? It's what the miners are doing. Uh, they do one, one thing and one thing only uh, if they're not running a full node, and that is uh, produce hashes using the Hashcash SHA-256 hashing algorithm. Uh, and what they're looking for is a particular hash that falls below the difficulty target of the network at any given point in time. Um, and so the difficulty target says, hey, you need to find a hash below this value. And if you do, it proves that you did some work because of the probabilistic nature of finding a hash of that value. Uh, the network can just assume, all right, it took you some work to do this. The miner that finds that hash below the target shows it to the rest of the network, says, hey, I found the hash. They say, yep, this is below the target. And then that miner, while it's looking for that hash, is also gathering up transactions that are in the mempools throughout the world and putting them into the block that they would eventually add to the ledger. So they find the hash, they get their transactions into a block, they add the block to the ledger, the network checks, are all these transactions in this block valid? Yes, all right, that's the new chain tip. Start going to look for the new hash. Uh, and go back to the difficulty target, that difficulty target changes every 2016 blocks uh, with the difficulty adjustment, and the difficulty adjustment is essentially uh, backwards looking at the, uh, the, the, the difficulty epoch and saying, hey, we're blocks coming in above or below 10 minutes on average. If they were coming in slower above 10 minutes on average, that means hash rate uh, may have left the network and so it's, uh, blocks aren't being <coughs> produced at the 10 minute target that the network sets out. So it says, okay, we're gonna uh, adjust downward which is a bit weird because the difficulty adjusts downward. It's easier to mine, but the difficulty target gets higher. Um, so you have to find a hash uh, that's not as low as it was before. If the blocks are coming in quicker than 10 minutes on average, coming in at nine minutes, let's say, uh, the network says, all right, it looks like some more hash rate has come on. Blocks are coming in too fast. Uh, so we're going to adjust difficulty upward X percent, which lowers that difficulty target, making it harder to find that hash. If people are winning too easily, the game gets harder. If people are not winning at all, the game gets easier. Succinctly put, by Matt. And then what, what happens if a mo No hash so, words. So right now, and I know that a lot of people in this room will know this, but I kind of want to can dig into this aspect of it. We talked about the, um, the ability with your own node to validate the full history of the Bitcoin blockchain, to validate all the current amount of Bitcoin outstanding, the, the reason why, in my view, or I would most succinctly describe Bitcoin has fundamental values because it represents a form of money that can't be printed and has a fixed supply. Um, and that running a node allows you to, to be able to verify that independently, as well as independ individual transactions. But say a, a Bitcoin miner mined a block and said, I'm, I'm owed seven new Bitcoin. Right now, uh, 6.25 Bitcoin are issued every 10 minutes. At launch, it was 50. After 210,000 blocks, cut to 25, then 12 and a half, now 6.25. But if a, if a Bitcoin miner mined an otherwise valid block but said, pay me seven Bitcoin, what happens? Well, they can get seven Bitcoin if there were uh, 75 million sats in fees in that block. Um, but I'm talking about that, the Coinbase, I'm talking about the Coinbase transaction. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but if they try to take more than the, the reward that is yeah. available to the network at any point in time, that block will get rejected. But funnily enough, if they ask for less, and this has happened uh, many times in Bitcoin's history, they will still get rewarded. So you can uh, get uh, an amount of reward up to the, the limits set by the network. So, I mean, I think MidMagic was the first one to ever burn Satoshi's in the block reward by saying, hey, I'm gonna sacrifice, I think it was like 210,000 sats. Um, and so he received at that point, I think it was a 25 uh, Bitcoin reward, he received 24.9750. And through that function nodes, and, and I think this is a, a key point of it, that people do not have to be mining Bitcoin to be able to validate the network and enforce the rules, and that's a key key function of nodes. Yes. So if you're not capitally equipped to buy the A6 yourself, um, right now they're relatively cheap, but they're not always as cheap as they are now. Um, many people look at that as a barrier to entry to police the network, but as Parker just mentioned, even if you're running a full node, 
uh, in a VPS spending $10 a month, you have the ability to monitor and reject transactions if they're not valid. And that's, it's, it's, it's not theoretical uh, because it actually happened a few years ago, 2019, I think, mm -hmm. um, where a mining pool had a bug in its software. It was last year, I believe. Uh, it's all blurred me, Marty. Uh, last year? It was pooling, right? Or yeah, pool? uh, one of those guys. And uh, they, um, they, the, the bug was basically that they included the transaction fees in the Coinbase transaction that pays the miner, but they forgot to include all the transactions uh, that would have paid that transaction fee. So from uh, a full nodes perspective that is receiving this block, it just looked like they were creating more Bitcoin out of thin air than they um, were entitled to, and so that block got rejected as invalid. And it's just, it's all fully automated. You know, every, it's not like we have to make phone calls and be like, hey, can you reject this block, right? Um, people just looked in, in the logs and were like, oh, this is weird. The, the software did something that it doesn't usually do because usually pools don't shoot themselves in the foot like this. Um, but uh, it, it just goes to show that Bitcoin's properties are not hypothetical, right? They're not dogmas that we have. They're, they're based on software engineering. They're based on what the code says and um, you know, it, it running as it should. And so I want to ask this question of each of you guys, and then we'll go to questions from the crowd. Um, obviously, it's important for people to run nodes. It's important for people to, to know how. It's important that the network remain decentralized and that just as a function of adoption increasing over time, more nodes will be run and more uh, the network will become more and more decentralized. How do you guys envision the network evolving and not necessarily saying to, to put a percentage on it, but just the type of individuals, the type of businesses, the type of institutions that will be running nodes, um, kind of forecasting out to the future. A lot of people run nodes, but they might not use them for everything that they could otherwise. I'm just kind of painting a vision for that of kind of what is healthy for the network in terms of um, the, the degree of decentralization, the, the, the number, the type of people running nodes. Uh, I think, it, I don't know if it's a contrarian view, but a lot of people don't agree with me on this, but I think... Uh, if somebody runs a media company that accepts Bitcoin both on chain and via Lightning, we've been running our own node for four years now, and I think this will be replicated. I think there's going to be like job specialization that emerges where if you're running a business and you're accepting Bitcoin transactions, you're incentivized to run your own node. So there will be a dedicated team member or whole team uh, that that operates your node as a business. So in terms of decentralization. Uh, from a business layer, like I run a media company, I run a node, I think that will be replicated uh, across uh, industries. I don't think it's just gonna be banks or financial institutions running nodes. Um, and obviously I think individuals will run nodes as well, but I think that bodes well for the future prospects of a sufficiently distributed full node topology. Um, and it, it, we run our node, Matt and I might demo something later, but it's because we wanna do I, I like receiving Bitcoin directly from our users, our customers. If you want to, uh, if we claim their, their listeners, they send us stuff for our media. Um, and it's just very comforting. And it's not that hard. Uh, I do have a dedicated uh, CTO who handles it. And I trust and we have a business relationship. So he does have access to the keys. And so there will have to be processes that are put in place about uh, access to the node and how you can send send funds specifically. But no, I think uh, from a business perspective, I think every industry will run Bitcoin nodes. Every, every company should run one. And I think that will be like an emerging job in the future is somebody who's operating and handling a node and particularly with the Lightning Network channel management, liquidity and um, trying to get yield on that liquidity as well. Matt, from your perspective, you're, again, I, you're going to give a presentation on this of kind of what you do beyond the Bitcoin side, but as it relates to Bitcoin and nodes, and not to go to the extreme of saying that, you know, I think it was Microsoft or the, someone saying like the goal being a computer in every home. Do you think that that's the world that 
we're working towards saying that, okay, it's not going to be everybody, but the vast majority of people, or kind of how do you, how do you see that playing out? Um, sure. So let me start slightly broader than Bitcoin, um, which is that, you know, we are a, a company, an organization that is out to proliferate uh, personal servers, right? We're out to get as many individuals, companies, and organizations running their own personal servers as possible. Um, and we don't even take the stance that the future uh, involves every person on earth running their own personal server. I don't think that that's ever going to happen. Um, it's the ideal. It's what we strive for. But it's also not necessary, right? What's necessary is critical mass. What's necessary is that there are enough individuals, family, heads of family, heads of organizations that are running personal servers that um, it pushes trust to the edges, right? Because I don't need to run my own Bitcoin node if my wife is, right? Like, I trust her. I don't need to run my own node. Not everyone needs to run their own node. Everyone needs to connect to a node of some, that is run by somebody that they trust. Uh, that is the real sort of practical reality of what we're dealing with here. Now, we push for everyone to run their own node, again, because it's the ideal. Um, but you know, today, uh, given the state of the Bitcoin network and its history of uh, attacks, related to double spends and you know, false reporting of incoming transactions, um, you can probably use Bitcoin uh, in a self-custodial way without running your own full node and pretty much get away with it. Most people do. Um, and your funds are not at risk. Uh, in a future society where everyone is transacting in Bitcoin over the Lightning Network, for example, um, then running your node, not only Bitcoin node, but Lightning node as well, becomes increasingly important. So, you know, just we, we set the ideal and we strive for it, but we're also practical about the fact that, like, it's not absolutely necessary that you run your own node today. You will probably be okay in most use cases. Like, your threat model does not involve somebody double spending to you for some huge transaction. Um, but uh, we recognize that laying this foundation, this decentralized foundation where everyone is taking personal responsibility and independent control over their money is essential. And so as a company, what we do is we actually recognize alternative inroads to this objective, right? So we don't just go around saying, everyone run your own Bitcoin node, because that's only going to reach this tiny little faction mm -hmm. of the world. But there's this whole other faction of the world that wants to take control over their photos because they don't want iPhoto and Google Photos to have intimate pictures of their family, for instance. And once we get them sort of into this idea of taking control of their data and information, then running a Bitcoin node is just one click away. So we view these things as complementary in nature. Um, and ultimately, all abiding by the same general concept of self hosting, of being independent of third parties in your general computing needs. Yeah, I think that's an important part about focusing on critical mass. And yeah. just like, Pierre, you brought up that decentralized, decentralization exists on a spectrum, that critical mass you know, is unknowable, but that the incentives existing to have more people opting in to take that responsibility on is what results in ultimately achieving critical mass. How do you think, Pierre, on the kind of the idea of critical mass specific to Bitcoin to avoid some future state where, where Bitcoin centralizes? Yeah, so I would, I would look at it really subjectively of, uh, can I write the code, download the code, compile it, download the binary, whatever it is, run this software, and actually have it sync. And if there are so few people on the Bitcoin network that um, IBD, the initial block download of syncing the node is um, bottlenecked by other people's upload speed, then we're in a bad spot, right? That, that means that we don't have enough nodes. Like that's to me the uh, most objective measure we can have is 
uh, go do it. If, if you can do it easily, then we're good. If, if, we, if, if it's taking you a long time, then we got problems. Um, and so uh, really, you know, it comes down to the fact that um, we hold money in order to hedge against future uncertainty. That's the fundamental reason why anyone holds money. And so um, it makes sense that when you're holding that money, you want to minimize your uncertainty. You want to use multi-sig, maybe with Unchained, maybe not. Uh, you want to run your own node, maybe with Start9, maybe not. But you have the optionality of doing these things in a way that um, really gives you like that peace of mind that Marty was talking about, that um, you don't have to worry about what's the bank going to do with my money, and you don't have to worry about what are the developers going to do with my monetary system. And so it, it really is to me like um, d you, you have to approach it as, as the user of, okay, I'm just gonna actually use this software, and if it works, that means that Bitcoin's decentralized enough because you were able to connect to enough peers that have enough upload bandwidth in order for you to, to sync. Um, and then if it doesn't, uh, then um, I think that you should reach out <laughs> and uh, let us know because we got we to gotta solve the problem. No, I think it's important to note to, I mean, Pierre explained earlier that the Bitcoin Core develop, development project takes a very conservative view. And I, I think we should also recognize that they understand these bottlenecks or these potential bottlenecks that could arise in the future, particularly around bandwidth and uh, the size of the chain state. And they're actively, like, this is the thing about Bitcoin that really irks me is everybody gets focused on the flashy stuff going on in other chains, whether it be Ethereum, Solana or whatever. But the real innovation in these distributed peer-to-peer -peer cash systems is really is happening on Bitcoin and it revolves around these efficiencies that will allow people people to run full nodes. So something like Erlay, which is a project that is looking to reduce the amount of bandwidth necessary to propagate transactions and messages at the P2P layer of Bitcoin. Uh, that's being worked on and it's making progress. It, made, uh, it hit a big milestone a couple of weeks ago when it allowed nodes to begin signaling whether or not they want Erlay as a messaging protocol. And if that gets implemented, that will significantly reduce the amount of bandwidth necessary to s propagate these transactions and therefore reduce the data burden on a full node operator. Similarly, you have things like UtreeXO that people are working on that will reduce the amount of data necessary to, to send transactions to. The, so I really, uh, you just brought to mind uh, one of the most important points I think on, on nodes is that the reason the developers have to optimize their innovation and their upgrades towards making it easier to run a Bitcoin node and more reliable and more efficient is because they depend on the users adopting those upgrades by downloading that new version of the node software. They can't push that update out to the users uh, they can't even have that annoying pop-up of, do you want to upgrade, not now, later, yes. So I always click not now, right? Like if it's working, uh, if, don't, don't change it, right? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, and um, other chains, for example, Ethereum, the way that they got their proof of stake upgrade was by forcing that upgrade onto the users using what's called the difficulty bomb, uh, which essentially was a hard-coded way of making sure that by a certain date, all of the node operators would be forced to adopt the new version of the software from the developers. And so uh, Bitcoin philosophically rejects that kind of coercion on users and is another example of why there simply is no alternative to how decentralized Bitcoin is. Yeah, and I do think that that's an important point and a great point to wrap up on is Bitcoin is voluntary and the version of the software that you run is a decision that you make and that if updates are made to it, you have to opt into that in a, with a forward action and uh, and you can run the numbers on, on the code itself before you do that. So. Uh, I think that was a great point to, to wrap up on, but why don't we turn to a few questions and then we can get into uh, Matt's demo and presentation. If you have a question, we'll give you a mic. Howdy. 
Uh, I'm a little bit new to the Bitcoin space. I think this Welcome. might be a, uh, a simple answer maybe, but why is having a fixed supply of Bitcoin preferable to having something that has, say, constant inflation? You're taking this. Um, great question. Um, having constant inflation would lead to a waste of electricity. <laughs> <laughs> would be my answer on that, really. Um, well, so there's there's no reason, there's no argument for having constant inflation. And so I think that now, what was Satoshi thinking when he put in the 21 million Bitcoin limit? We don't know, actually. There, that's a, you, you can impute anything you want onto that because he never really explained what he was thinking. It seemed to be an accident of how he programmed the halvings uh, with the uh, right shift binary operator eventually zeroing out the subsidy. Um, I don't know if that was something that he like made a conscious design decision up front of this is only going to be 21 million Bitcoin and here, here's how I'm going to program it versus here's how I programmed it and it turns out it's 21 million Bitcoin. But um, yeah, there's there, lots of arguments have been floated as to uh, why that, that limit should be lifted and you should have like a constant you know, 1% or whatever. Um, some of them are economic of uh, deflation is bad because, you know, if you've got a fixed supply and increase in demand for the money, then uh, you get deflation. Uh, so for, for that, I would recommend a book uh, called Deflation and Liberty by uh, Holzman that explains why uh, that argument doesn't hold water. Um, the second one, you'll hear people say like, oh, well, the money should go to developers, right? We should have a developer fund. Uh, from uh, additional inflation. Um, the problem with that is that you just end up attracting rent seekers. And I don't want to accuse any developers of being that, but uh, I, I, I don't think that's how you get the best work done by having kind of a free money spigot. Um, and then the third argument is about Bitcoin's long-term security. Um, I just published a piece on this. Um, so. Uh, go to riotblockchain.com to media research, and then you've got my PDF there. The short answer is that Bitcoin's transaction finality, also known as people refer to it as security, which is a misnomer, but its transaction finality comes from transaction fees. It does not come from the subsidy. So there's no reason why increasing the subsidy would affect uh, transaction finality. Yeah, and even if you were to introduce inflation at this point, it's arbitrary. Maybe you start out with 50 bips or a whole percent, but you do that once, and it's like, oh, maybe that wasn't enough. We, we gotta bump it up to 2% now. And so like the arbitrary nature, nature of that tail emissions just creates a social attack vector where people in the future will be able to say it's not enough it also anymore. Be a hard fork, so. Yes, that, that as well. Yeah, the, and the other thing I would just add is, it's like we can talk about things in theory, but then if you get down to human action and just think about you yourself, it's like, you, your, you and your time are scarce. Your ability to produce output for others is tied to your amount of time. And that if you could be paid in a form of money that nobody else could print at all versus one that somebody could print 0.5% of or 1% or 1.5%, that you as an individual would have the maximum incentive to opt into a system that allowed people to pr print money the least. And in that world, that absolute value of zero is the best that you can do or the optimal state. And then when you take those individual decision points of thinking about yourself and then the ne person next to you, the person next to you, everybody also has that shared incentive to not allow other people to arbitrarily create money or just for that, that excess value to leak out in return for um, actual value being transferred between two humans. Yeah, I, all, good, all good. Yeah, I, I would just argue that monetary policy, in my opinion, was probably the most arbitrary part of Bitcoin's entire conception. Um, we don't really know if a fixed cap monetary policy is better than a perpetual fixed tail emission that tends to zero inflation over time. Um, or if some sort of other thing, what matters most is consensus and predictability. It's that you know what the money is supply is going to be in 100 years so that you can plan accordingly. 
That's the most important thing, is that it's set, fixed, predictable, and very hard to change. Uh, I believe Satoshi himself expressed some degree of just sort of like, yeah, I kind of mimicked gold as why not. Um, the monetary policy is not, I don't think, the most critical aspect. And thinking of, I mean, the security budget argument, it's, it's mental, me. it's mental masturbation in my mind. You, yeah. We don't know the security budget. You don't know the security budget until it's attacked, and then at that point, people will just spend more in fees to get more confirmations on, to get their fees, in, or excuse me, the transactions included in the blocks, and then if worse comes to worse, you just have to wait X amount of blocks to be comfortable with your transaction being uh, settled in the network. Yeah, and mining is just one function within the economy and would take the share of the economy that the, the free market basically put its value on, right? Yeah. Like that, you know, mining Bitcoin, the security function is just one of a thousand things in the real economy that are going to need to compete for Bitcoin and that the market will put a price on what it wants to pay for security via transaction fees. Yeah, and the difficulty adjustment exists, so. Thank you very much. Good question. So I know we've dabbled enough with enough side chain talk tonight, and uh, I know that everything is pretty much good for Bitcoin, but uh, Tornado Cash, or was that a Tornado Cash? Yeah. Okay. What is uh, y'all's personal beliefs on that? I know we've kind of dabbled in privacy tonight, but like, what's your personal belief as far as Tornado Cash goes? Was it positive? Negative, neutral, how you feel? Think so it's here, I'll, let me first explain for folks that might not be familiar, and then I'll let you guys take a crack at your thoughts. So um, Tornado Cash, my understanding is that it's an open source piece of software, not related to Bitcoin, but um, it was a service that allowed for um, similar services that exist in Bitcoin, like coin joins. Um, to anonymize transaction sets in other cryptocurrencies. And it's a privacy-preserving per tool, you know, and Tornado Cash is specific to another cryptocurrency, but similar applications exist in Bitcoin, and the U.S. Treasury Department um, sanctioned the, uh, the software itself, or at least that's what it appeared initially, um, and then I think they later clarified that they actually were sanctioning a service and the individuals, but the consequence or the, the complexity that was introduced was, um, was the U.S. Treasury taking the action to, to sanction a piece of software and that anybody who was using it, whether for legal or illicit purposes, were they then guilty of a crime? And then if we bring it to Bitcoin, it could be if you're running a node and someone else is, is running a node and using it illicitly, could you potentially be, um, you know, not at fault, but accused of a crime for having routed or validated a transaction that was passed to you that originated for illicit purposes. So I just wanted to provide that background and then these guys can talk about the, the relevance or the consequences to Bitcoin. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So as far as I'm aware, the initial stance of the U.S. Treasury has not changed. Um, however, I know that um, Coin Center, I want to say, has filed a lawsuit against them, against OFAC, essentially claiming that what they did was outside of their jurisdiction. Um, what happened here was in an unprecedented way, the United States Treasury said that no American citizen can interact with a piece of software. Um, this has never happened before. They have said on multiple occasions that you cannot interact with a certain uh, person or group of persons, in, including entire nation states, um, as ridiculous as that sounds. But for the first time ever, they basically said that uh, no US citizen can interact with this piece of software, which of course is kind of unenforceable kind of an impossible stance to take. They kind of look like fools in doing this. And I think they're slowly realizing this, at least I hope they are. Um, and, you know, so our response to this, um, and this is, Tornado Cash is, is an Ethereum smart contract designed to 
um, mix uh, ether such that you know it preserves the privacy of the the owners of that of that asset. Um, so aside from the fact that it's running on Ethereum and we have our own stances on that protocol and project, um, our response was to uh, implement a service on our operating system and platform that would allow anybody in the world to, um, with minimal effort, mirror a code base that they deemed to be of interest. So for instance, if you were an individual and felt that everyone on Earth should be able to run an instance of and utilize the Tornado Cache protocol, you could trivially host a copy of the Tornado Cache source code such that anybody else in the world could get it from you anonymously. You could host it anonymously and they could obtain it anonymously, run it on their own systems anonymously and participate anonymously. So our response personally as a company and organization to the Treasury's actions was to demonstrate the absurdity of their actions by pushing the code base and the proliferation of that code base uh, underground such that anyone, even non-technical people, could just sort of like use it, could violate the law with impunity. Um, and we hope that that demonstration, along with many others, will ultimately you know, prove to the authorities that their efforts are futile and this is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we should start off with like OFAC, FATF, all these Orwellian regulatory bodies are just that Orwellian and I don't think they should have any authority over us, but as it pertains to Bitcoin and what Bitcoiners should be on lookout for, yes, there's coin join implementations like join market, Wasabi, Samurai, it's not hard to believe that they would be similar targets if they were to attain the same volume that Tornado Cash did when it was humming. Um, but I think this just highlights a um, topic we've been talking about all night, which is running your own full node. And, and I think a lot of the ability of these regulatory agencies and the governments to make these types of actions, uh, if they were to try to bring it to Bitcoin, it really stems from the fact that a lot of people have their personal identifying information attached to their Bitcoin UTXOs, especially if they're uh, receiving or buying Bitcoin on an exchange and then sending it to a wallet. These governments and the chain analysis companies that they contract out use her chain heuristics to sort of guess uh, who owns what UTXO using the, the links to the personal information that exists on these centralized third parties. Uh, and this highlights the need to slowly but surely and hopefully more quickly over time, transition to a circular economy where people are just uh, transacting in a true peer-to-peer -peer fashion and not really touching any of these fiat on and off ramps. Uh, I think once you get a critical mass of people uh, in the circular Bitcoin economy just transacting strictly in Bitcoin and never touching the fiat world, the heuristics that these chain analysis companies use to attach a UTXO to a, to a personal identity become extremely hard to successfully um, uh, use. I don't really have anything to add to that. All right, why don't we uh, wrap it there and then uh, we can get into the um, presentation and panel by Matt, for presentation and demo. Thanks, guys. Pierre, Marty.